The history of Disney is peppered with ups and downs, much like any other company that's nearly a century old would be. A lot of the times those downs can be traced back to poor decisions the company made, whether it was a general direction they went in or a specific project that just flopped. However, sometimes it's completely out of their hands. This was one of those times. October 6th, 1973. Just a few days prior, Disney had celebrated the second anniversary of the opening of Walt Disney World in Central Florida. It was a project dreamed up by Walt himself, however with his unexpected passing in 1966, it would be his older brother Roy who would lead the company to complete the first phase of the East Coast project. Disney World opened on time and by all measures was a success. So when its second birthday rolled around, they had plenty to celebrate. Meanwhile, just over six and a half thousand miles away, on the other side of the globe, there was far less celebrating going on. Because that was the day the Yom Kippur War, otherwise known as the October War, had begun. Egyptian forces carried out a surprise attack against Israeli forces in an attempt to retake Sinai, starting with the Suez Canal. Now this conflict, like multiple conflicts during that time, doubled as a proxy for the Cold War tensions between the United States and the USSR. The USSR sided with Egypt, while the United States lent support to Israel to the tune of $2.2 billion in aid. In retaliation, on October 17th, OPEC, or the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, instituted an oil embargo against the United States as well as other nations known to support Israel. And it wasn't just an embargo either. OPEC began to lower their oil output so that there was less supply to go around. What resulted was a shortage for not just the United States but multiple European countries as well. The US had to act, or more aptly, they had to react. And they did just that with the Emergency Petroleum Allocation Act, which was introduced in the Senate just a couple of weeks after the embargo went into effect. In short, it gave President Nixon the authority and responsibility to regulate the production and distribution of petroleum in the United States. As a nation, we no longer had the seemingly unlimited access to oil that we were used to. This act meant that gas stations were limited in how much gas they could sell, who they could sell it to, and even what days of the week they could sell it on. That's where Disney comes in. In 1973, commercial flight was around. However, it wasn't as ubiquitous as it is today. As a result, a reported 85% of guests visiting Walt Disney World were doing so by car. On top of that, the majority of guests were coming from outside of the state of Florida, with only 27% of park attendants coming from locals. That means a lot of Disney tourists were driving pretty long distances, and that posed a problem during an unexpected fuel shortage. By the time the Christmas season rolled around that year, Disney World attendance was already down 8.9% over the previous year. In California, the Disneyland Christmas season attendance was down nearly 14%. If that wasn't bad enough, this was at a point in the company's history in which over two-thirds of their revenue was coming from the two resorts. And while those numbers were a concern for Disney, they were nothing compared to what other amusements and vacation businesses in the state were experiencing. See, on a smaller scale, the idea of cutting down on recreation to conserve gas was an annoyance, but one people could live with. However, with the opening of Disney World just a few years earlier, not to mention the long list of beaches, tourism was Florida's economic backbone. It was reported that hotels and motels in the Disney area were operating at under 30% occupancy that holiday season. It didn't help that there was also an overabundance of hotel rooms due to everyone trying to cash in on Disney's success. Smaller attractions such as SeaWorld and Fort Lauderdale's Ocean World struggled with the same attendance issues. As one spokesman for the Lion Country Safari put it, we get a lot of travelers who come to Florida to see Disney World, then keep heading south, stopping off at our place and others. If Disney has trouble, we all suffer. Disney, like the US when faced with the initial embargo, had to react. They did, and in some pretty interesting ways. The first step they took was to build up their own supply of fuel for potential difficult times. 
According to Reality Land by David Koenig, Disney purchased 1 million gallons of jet fuel to keep on the side in the event of a drastic shortage so that they could keep their on-site power generators running. They also looked to balance out the source of their guests, both investing in television campaigns that advertise the parks more heavily to Florida locals, and also by opening the Walt Disney World Travel Co. The subsidiary set up offices overseas in Tokyo and London in hopes of winning over more international guests. They also pledged to put more of an emphasis on their film studios so that they would be less dependent on park performance. However, while these were shorter term solutions to try and hold things over, the energy crisis had longer lasting effects as well. They put the other two hotels slated for the Seven Seas Lagoon monorail loop, Disney's Asian Resort and Disney's Venetian Resort, on the back burner. After all, they had to worry about keeping their current hotels full before they could worry about building new ones. This is when we would see projects such as Pirates of the Caribbean, Space Mountain, the Carousel of Progress, Star Jets, which today is known as Astro Orbiter, and Treasure Island, which would later be known as Discovery Island. Perhaps the most interesting reaction from Disney during the crisis, however, was their attempt to diversify. While fuel might have been in short supply, one thing Disney had plenty of was land, and they wanted to put it to use. That January, Disney announced plans to utilize 9,000 acres of their property. They formed Lake Buena Vista Communities Incorporated, which set aside 1,000 acres for beef cattle production and 8,000 acres for reforestation for the paper industry with Hudson Pulp and Paper Corp. Here's Disney getting into the paper and beef industry just to offset these attendance drops. Unfortunately, they still struggled. Drop in attendance meant a drop in earnings, and a drop in earnings meant trouble for their stock. Shares that earlier in the year were trading as high as $120 were now trading at just $37. By early January, they laid off 700 additional cast members on top of the 1,000 seasonal cast members they were already planning to let go. Work hours for those who remained were slashed by up to 20%. Disney was monitoring how many cars were on average crossing state lines to try and anticipate attendance and adjust their workforce on a day-by-day -day basis. And yet, for as bad as all that looked, this was Disney weathering the storm. Many local hotels and motels were not so fortunate, and would end up going out of business altogether. So what happened? Well, for as much as the start of their oil troubles was out of their hands, so was the end. The October War itself had ended back in, well, October, with a ceasefire. However, OPEC demanded that Israel withdraw from the territories it had come to hold. And while they didn't withdraw to the point that OPEC demanded, they did pull back to the east side of the Suez Canal months later on March 5th. And just 12 days after that, OPEC decided to end the oil embargo. And so with access to oil returned, Disney, like much of the travel industry, rebounded. Guests began to return to the parks, earnings began to climb again, and 500 of the 700 laid-off cast members were quickly rehired. By April, reservations for Disney's Polynesian and Contemporary Resort were up 42% over the previous month. But while the short-term impacts of the embargo were quickly reversed, it still left a lasting footprint on Disney's history. The Asian and Venetian Resort would ultimately never get built, and without such a fate, there wouldn't have been room for the Grand Floridian Resort that we have today. The oil crisis of 1973 was a stressful time, not just for Disney, but for the state and the country as well. It was a reminder that we lived in a global community, and how quickly an event on the other side of the world could impact our day-to-day -day life. It was a lesson in coping with circumstances outside of our control, and it was one that had a lasting impact on Walt Disney World.